We've had some delays and we've wondered if this bird was going to fly. But fly it did. The largest and most powerful rocket to ever leave Earth's atmosphere was launched by NASA from historic Pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in the early hours of the 16th of November. And if you think the launch was impressive, stick around because this is proving to be a hell of a mission. So, as we release this, we're 15 days into this historic Artemis 1 mission, with 10 more days to go until it splashes down in the Pacific off San Diego, assuming it does. This is a test flight of NASA's new moon rocket, and every step of the mission is under scrutiny because none of the hardware has ever flown before. Some variants of it, sure, the rocket engines and the solid rocket boosters are all evolved from shuttle, in order to keep the costs down, but this is an entirely different beast to shuttle. It's designed to take people beyond Earth orbit and onto the moon, something the shuttle could never do. That's why it might have a vaguely Saturn V look about it, with all that shuttle orange too, of course. So, Artemis 1 sat on the pad in the dead of night on the 16th of November, and 43 minutes after the launch window opened, it let out its 8.4 million pounds of thrust, more than the mighty Saturn V, almost three times more powerful than the Space Shuttle, illuminating the sky for miles around and visible hundreds of miles away. Everybody that watched got a real treat to see the most powerful rocket to ever reach space. Only the Russian moon rocket N1 was more powerful, but that failed to be anything more than a fireball each time they tried to launch it. But NASA's new moon rocket successfully launched on its first attempt and brought daylight to the night sky. It took just eight minutes to reach Earth orbit, during which time it jettisoned the launch tower to prove that safety device worked. That'll be needed in the event of a rocket failure to blast the capsule and future crews away from the exploding rocket, something that the shuttle couldn't do. Once in space, NASA waited less than a single orbit to fire its upper stage engines. That took it from orbital speed of 17,000 miles an hour to the velocity needed to enter TLI, or translunar injection. That's around 22,000 miles an hour. At that point, the first spacecraft built for humans since 1972 was headed to the moon. But this mission is also taking a bunch of CubeSats to deploy in the lunar environment too. So once on the way to the moon, the capsule separated from the upper stage, revealing 10 CubeSats in a ring around the inside of the upper stage. If you take a look at this image of them all neatly stowed before being mated to the rocket itself, you can now make them out quite clearly as the upper stage gets jettisoned in space. And because there's no wind resistance in space, this upper stage will follow behind the capsule all the way to the moon, so those CubeSats could be released at the right time, a safe distance from the capsule to conduct a ton of science experiments. We also understand this all went well too. But by day three of the mission, the capsule had deployed its solar panels for power and was already halfway to the moon, going through a whole barrage of tests with Mike Serafin, the Artemis 1 mission manager, saying, we met to review the Orion spacecraft performance and it's exceeding performance expectations. Which is really good because these tests are absolutely crucial as the next flight will have a human crew. So we have to know that everything works perfectly or is easily fixed to make perfect for the next flight. And then we got the images from a camera mounted on one of the solar panels. Pretty much everything NASA does during its missions is important and necessary. It may seem like NASA is just getting some selfies, but these images are also inspections. The cameras were used to inspect the thermal protection system on the crew module and the service module provided by the European Space Agency, which provides Orion with propulsion, water, oxygen, electrical power, and controls the temperature of the spacecraft and all its components. Part of this inspection includes looking for micrometeorite impacts and hits from orbital debris, something that will be monitored throughout the whole flight. It's worth remembering that the Artemis 1 mission is due to last twice as long as Apollo 17, NASA's longest of the moon missions. So that's a lot of exposure to the hazards of space. 
The optical navigation camera is designed to detect and track objects like the moon, geological features on the moon and the earth for navigation. So they're deliberately very contrasty rather than high resolution that we'd want for good, pretty pictures. But I'm sure you'll agree with me that while we've been spoilt by pretty images recently from the likes of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, James Webb Space Telescope or the Juno mission at Jupiter, these are still stunning photographic captures that spark the imagination. On the way out to the Moon, Orion is deliberately only flung as far as the point where the Moon's gravity becomes more dominant than the Earth's, known as the neutral point, which is only 27,000 miles from the Moon itself. 211,000 miles from Earth, so all the capsule had to do was crawl over this point in space and it would begin speeding up again as the Moon began pulling it in. At that point, five days after launch, Orion had slowed from the 22,000 miles per hour it needed to escape Earth orbit to just 100 miles an hour as it limped into the Moon's sphere of gravitational dominance. And oh my god did that open up a week of incredible imagery. Orion is fitted with a star tracking camera, the optical navigation camera we mentioned earlier, a better resolution camera for NASA to take us all along with them, and an internal camera to follow the radiation test dummies, Snoopy and Sean the Sheep. Look, you can see one of the test dummies here on the left, and Snoopy's here if you look hard enough. And here he is again floating around. The lamb chop's nowhere to be seen, unfortunately. And what do you think? Did NASA really put some funky disco lights in there? And all the way out to the moon, we were treated to some incredible views. A selfie with the receding Earth. A selfie with the advancing moon. All the while the moon was getting closer. But what very few of us were expecting were the pictures as the Orion capsule reached the moon and swung around the far side. Just like the Apollo days, there are no communication relay satellites around the Moon, so when the spacecraft gets so close to the Moon that the Earth disappears behind it, all links with the spacecraft drop out for 47 minutes until it swings around the other side of the Moon and re-establishes connection with the Earth. So this is the full video sent back later, the original video that we watched live cut out at this point. We will put relay satellites in lunar orbit in the coming years so this won't happen for future crewed missions, but it's always an exciting time in the mission, and just look at the video of the Earth disappearing behind the Moon again. There really is something truly sublime about this image, and that we've advanced as a species sufficiently to be able to take this most rare form of videography. And here's the video of the Earth re-emerging from the shadowed far side of the Moon, rising like a jewel, which of course it is, because that little marble suspended in the eternal void of space is where every known life form in the entire universe lives, so delicate and fragile, that's where we are, quarrelling with and killing each other in wars while polluting the only place we can call home. Then we got the images Orion had captured as it got within 81 miles of the lunar surface. Not perfect resolution images, but hey, it's 81 miles away. These images had been taken half an hour earlier, but with no link to Earth, we had to wait until Earth was in view again to send them back by radio. Until then, the Moon itself was blocking all the signals to or from the spacecraft. It was on its own. Something we couldn't do in the Apollo days. There was no autopilot or automation. They had to have a crew member in the spacecraft. That's why the Apollo 8 test mission around the Moon had a crew rather than being a less risky uncrewed test flight like Artemis 1. A quick photo merge in Photoshop and you can put all of these images together in the one composite image that shows the view Artemis 1 had as it passed over the Moon. At this point Orion's trajectory took it on an elongated loop out and back again towards the Moon, a complex but fuel efficient orbit known as a distant retrograde orbit, where it'll remain for about a week to test the spacecraft systems. All the while, on this distant loop around the Moon, it's taking images that just fill the heart with joy and make us wonder what quality cameras the crew will take on the Artemis II mission in 2024. This image in particular of the Moon and Earth together, from thousands of miles away on the far side of the Moon, is a never-before-taken picture. The Apollo astronauts never flew this far from Earth to get a picture like this. 
Orion is currently over 264,000 miles from Earth and nearly 46,000 miles from the Moon, cruising at 1,790 miles per hour. After a week as we release this video, perhaps days, weeks or months ago as you watch this, the service module lights its engines again for a trans-Earth injection burn, or TEI, to get back to Earth. If every element worked fine, the space launch system, the Orion capsule, and the service module, plus all the subsystems, the power, climate control, computers, parachutes, etc, etc, this giant rocket will be certified for sending humans to the moon. The next flight, Artemis 2, will send four astronauts around the moon and fly several thousand miles above the lunar far side before trekking back to Earth. On Artemis 3, which will be the first Artemis mission to put humans on the lunar surface, Orion will get into an orbit balanced between the Earth's and the Moon's gravity called a near-rectilinear halo orbit, which provides access to the Moon's south pole, where 13 candidate landing regions have already been identified for future Artemis missions. I was excited before, but after seeing Artemis play out so successfully so far, I just can't wait. But go and take a look at these videos from us now, because there is so much good stuff about this next great adventure to the moon and then Mars. What a time to be alive.